There are a lot of powerful spells in D&D that have the potential to shape or break a campaign in various different ways. Some spells have really high damage output, while other spells might excel at fulfilling a certain niche or role your party might need to be filled. However, there are some spells that are considered so strong and exploitable that these spells tend to either get banned or reworked to make them feel more balanced. So in this video, we're going to go over some of the spells that are widely considered some of the most powerful spells you can obtain. Whether it be due to ease of usage, or for how easy the spells to exploit and take advantage of, or just the general impact of a campaign overall. And firing this list up at number 10, we have our good friend Fireball. This is a third level spell with a range of 150 feet, a cast time of one action, and can cover a huge radius of 20 feet in a sphere on a certain point, which deals 86 fire damage to everything inside of it, and send into flame anything flammable that isn't being worn or carried. And for a third level spell, the damage Fireball can cause is unmatched by few spells until you get access to much higher level spells. The only real downside is that it deals fire damage, which a lot of enemies in the game can resist or outright be immune to, especially during later parts of the game. However, despite that fact, Fireball still remains relevant throughout the entirety of the campaign due to not only its high damage output, but also its ease of use and even easier targeting, since its radius is big enough to be able to engulf more than one enemy within its sphere, unless your targets are very spread out. And if you're an evocation wizard, you also don't ever have to worry about hitting any of your friends due to the sculpt spell feature allowing you to emit up to four creatures from the damage and blast radius when using the spell, making this spell even easier to manage and use. And for the amount of damage Fireball can do, 86 damage equates to an average of 28 damage total. To put this in perspective, the highest damaging second level spell like Shatter or Rhyme's Binding Ice only deal 3d8 damage, or an average of 13 damage. And the next strongest third level spell that isn't Lightning Bolt, which also has the same damage, is Tidal Wave, which deals 4d8 bludgeoning damage, or an average of 18 damage but can also prone targets in the area. So already Fireball's damage is much higher than any other spell within its own level and easily furthers the gaps between third and second level spells in terms of damage. And in terms of higher level spells, you won't find anything that deals more damage than simply upcasting Fireball using your desired spell slot until you gain access to the seventh level spells, where you can learn Delayed Fireball, which is technically only slightly stronger if you drop concentration on it immediately after your turn ends, since dropping concentration can be done at any time without using any of your actions. And while there are definitely stronger spells, such as Meteor Swarm, a 9th level spell which deals 46 total damage, split between 20 to 6 bludgeoning and fire damage, Fireball is readily available upon reaching 5th level as a full caster class such as Wizard or Sorcerer, meaning it gets to see more use as opposed to Meteor Swarm, which only becomes available at the back end of a campaign since 9th level spells are only obtainable at 17th level. However, the reason why Fireball only takes the 10th spot on this list is because, unlike most of the spells we're going to be going over, the only thing Fireball really does is force your DM to adjust future encounters to compensate for the sudden influx of power your party will be receiving as a result, which is not an uncommon thing to do over the course of the game anyway. It's just a more prominent spell for this to happen with among others. And at number 9 we have Animate Objects. This is a 5th level concentration spell which allows you to animate up to 10 tiny or small inanimate objects within 120 feet that are non-magical and not being worn or carried. However, the number of items you can animate varies depending on the size of the object. Medium objects count as 2 objects towards the 10 object limit, large objects count as 4, and huge count as 8. And each object has their own hit points, AC, damage values, as well as their own ability scores, with strength and dexterity varying between sizes. They all possess 30 feet of movement, which can also be flying speed if the object has no way of moving on its own, such as legs on a statue. However, what makes this spell a true contender for one of the most powerful spells in this list is definitely the amount of total damage it can deal against the creature. Much like how Fireball can deal a tremendous amount of damage to multiple creatures, Animate objects can do the same thing to a single creature. You see, tiny objects deal 1d4 plus 4 bludgeoning damage and has a plus 8 to hit. And if you manage to fit all 10 of these tiny objects within 5 feet of a creature, which is pretty easy if you're animating 10 silver coins, allowing them to fly, for instance, then you can have all of them attack the single creature for 10d4 plus 40 damage. To put this into perspective, a 5th level fireball will do an average of 35 fire damage to a single target. Whereas, animate objects used against one target is equal to an average of 65, with the minimum amount of damage doing being 50 if you only rolled once. Obviously, this does assume that your objects hit their target so the damage can vary and change on a dime. But overall, animate objects and fireball both work really well together since they both allow you to reliably cover single target and multi-target options whenever needed, and deal enough damage that you don't really need anything else for the most part. And you can even use them together since commanding your objects only uses your bonus action. So you can also cast Fireball on subsequent turns after you use Animate Objects in order to maximize your damage in a single turn. However, be aware of the downsides of Animate Objects, which is their attacks are not considered magical. Which means that anything that is resistant or immune to non-magical bludgeoning, slashing, or piercing damage can give you trouble. 
In which case you're better off using an alternative spell like Bigsby's Hand if you're looking for a spell that has good single target damage in the form of force damage, and a bit of utility since of being able to push or grapple opponents. Otherwise, the damage of this spell and how easy it is to use are more than enough to tank on most encounters. As for why this spell takes number 9 on this list, well it's mostly for the same reasons as Fireball. All it does is deal really high damage which can force your DM to adjust certain encounters accordingly with these two spells in mind if they still want to give your party a challenge. But sometimes having high damage isn't all it takes to make a powerful spell, which can be proven by the next spell on this list. And at number 8 we have Banishment. This is a 4th level concentration spell that allows you to poof away a creature to a different plane of existence for up to 1 minute if they fail a charisma saving throw in order to resist the effect altogether. However, there are two different things that happen depending on whether or not the creature is native to your plane of existence. If it is, then it will simply put into a harmless demiplane where it will stay in timeout for the combat until the spell ends. In which case it returns as if it were the nearest unoccupied space closest to where it would first banished. However, if that creature is not native to your plane of existence, then the creature is transported back to its home plane with a faint poppy noise to alert you of that fact, and will stay there if you manage to concentrate on the spell for the full minute. Otherwise, it will return to your plane of existence. This spell is excellent for taking out one creature from combat, regardless of whether or not the creature is native to your plane. Or you can banish multiple creatures if you upcast it, since using a 5th level spell slot or higher allows you to target an additional creature for each slot above the 4th level, which can make many combat fights significantly easier. You also don't have to worry about the creature breaking out or returning to their own plane since the spell also incapacitates them for the duration of the spell, meaning they can't use any actions or reactions during that time. The reason why this is so important is because it reduces the action economy available to your enemies. Action economy is basically an implicit resource mechanic of the game where the amount of actions your party can make in comparison to your enemies can drastically sway the course of an encounter. If there are only 4 of you and 6 enemies, then it's safe to assume that your enemies have a slight advantage due to having more action economy and things to do overall. Usually, the fastest way to get rid of action economy is to get rid of your enemies whether it's by reducing their hit points to zero or outright banishing a problematic enemy to the Shadow Realm temporarily. And if you manage to banish a particularly strong demon and manage to maintain your concentration for a full minute, then you have effectively eliminated the demon with only a single spell, which is not common to do. However, there are a couple of downsides of banishment which keep it from being higher on this list, and that's mainly because it requires a charisma saving throw in order to pull it off. This isn't normally a problem at the time you're able to learn the spell, however, as the campaign progresses, a lot of creatures, namely fiends and celestials, tend to have much higher charisma scores and proficiencies which can hinder this spell a lot more in terms of usefulness. The other reason is because there's a spell that can basically accomplish what the spell does but better and can be obtained at a little earlier level, which we'll get into in time. And at number 7 we have Wall of Force. This is the 5th level concentration spell that allows you to create an impassable and invisible wall of force at a point of your choosing within 120 feet of you for up to 10 minutes. You can shape this wall by either creating a hemisphere or a sphere with a radius of 10 feet, or you create a series of 10 10x10 10 10 panels for the purpose of creating boxes, ramps, bridges, or whatever other construct you wish, so long as the panels are touching one another. This spell is extremely useful because it allows passage to nothing and is immune to all damage. The wall can't even be dispelled through the use of dispel magic. In fact, the only way you can actually get rid of the wall force is by casting the spell Disintegrate on it, which is a 6 level spell. So only stronger creatures will be able to effectively counter it. What makes this spell so powerful though is the fact that you can trap creatures inside of the wall with no easy way for them to get out. In fact, they wouldn't even be able to use spells or abilities that allow them to travel through the ethereal plane, such as Blink, a third level spell which specifically allows you to travel in and out of the ethereal plane, and can allow for the caster to more easily escape a hostile environment in this case, since Wall of Force also blocks ethereal travel through it. The spell can sort of work like a light version of Force Cage, a 7th level spell which is specifically designed to entrap things within it as well as preventing most types of teleportation from functioning while inside of it, unless they successfully pass a charisma saving throw. However, Wall of Force has the added flexibility of being shaped into extra terrain that can be manipulated in ways to reach new areas, since nothing can pass through it and nothing says you can't walk out the wall either if it's laid horizontally or diagonally in an upwards direction. You can also use this spell to protect your party temporarily against outside hazards, such as sandstorms or falling debris, or as a way to trap a creature inside a toxic or hazardous environment. Do keep in mind, however, that the invisible wall does count as full cover for the purposes of spells that require you to see the target, so to speak. This basically means that for spells like Vicious Mockery, which require you to target a creature you can see, wouldn't be able to affect a creature that's on the other side of the wall of force, despite the fact that it technically is a sound-based spell. There are a few sage advice posts from Jeremy Crawford, one of the developers of D&D 5e, where he clarifies this. On one of them, he states in a response to a question asked about whether or not Hold Person can be used from the other side of a wall of force, that... With a spell, you can't target a creature behind total cover unless the spell says otherwise, followed by the page number of the PHB where, under the A Clear Path to the Target section, it states, 
To target something, you must first have a clear path to it, so it can't be behind total cover. This can be a bit confusing, as there are technically some spells that can still pass through the Wall of Force, namely teleportation spells. A quick example would be the second level spell Misty Step, which teleports you up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space as you can see. But the reason why Misty Step would still work in this incidence is because it has a range of self, rather than an actual range which targets an area. So if you're trapped inside a wall of force, you would still be able to just Misty Step without any problems because you're not targeting anything outside of it, only yourself, allowing you to successfully break out of your imprisonment. There's also another spell that you can use if you're looking for an offensive option to attack something on the side of the wall. The fourth level spell, Rothatham Psychic Lance, has an alternative way of targeting creatures by allowing you to utter the creature's name, forcing the creature to become the target so long as they're within 120 feet range of the spell, even if you can't see it. Overall, Wall of Force is an amazing spell, both in combat and out, which is why it deserves a spot on this list at number 7. And at number 6, we have Leoman's Tiny Hut. This is a third level spell which creates a 10 foot radius dome of force that can house up to 9 creatures of medium size or smaller and lasts for 8 hours. It normally takes 1 minute to cast, but because it also has the ritual tag, some spellcasters can spend 11 minutes to ritual cast instead of using a spell slot. This dome protects any creatures that are inside the dome at the time of casting from pretty much any outside effects such as projectiles or spells or magical effects. However, the hut also comes with a dry and comfy environment, allowing your party to take refuge in harsh deserts or snowy mountains, where finding proper shelter might be tough to come by. Creatures also can't pass into the dome from outside unless they were a creature that was already inside the dome when the spells first cast. The intended use of the spell is to provide your party with a place to take long rest whenever you want, since the spell lasts for 8 hours and doesn't require concentration. So if you or your party are heads deep inside a dungeon or far from civilization, then Liamud's Tiny Hut is a fantastic way to rest up, especially since ritual casting it wouldn't eat up a spell slot, so a wizard wouldn't need to save a spell slot if they wanted to have a safety net in case you and your party aren't able to seek proper refuge. However, what makes the spell particularly powerful is the way it's worded. You see, objects and creatures can't pass through the dome from outside. However, if your party is inside the dome by the time the hut goes up, then objects they use can pass through the dome and move freely through it. This means that if you have anyone with a long range weaponry, such as a bow and arrow, then they can effectively shoot at anything outside the hut, which is transparent from the inside of it. And while spells and magical effects normally can't pass through the dome no matter what, there is nothing stopping one of your spellcasters from leaving the dome, casting a fireball, and then retreating back into the safety of the dome on their turn. The only caveat is that the caster of the tiny hut can't leave the dome, since this is one of the criteria for ending the spell early. And since the tiny hut is opaque from the outside, it can make it difficult for enemies to know where you're coming from if someone decides to exit the bubble and he has a powerful spell. However, there are ways around this if the enemy has a ranged weaponry, and that's for them to ready their actions to shoot at anything that decides to come out of the hut. But even then, your ranged attackers can still pick them off from within the hut if need be. Really, the only reliable way to work around Liamud's tiny hut is by casting Dispel Magic on it, which would instantly end the spell early, exposing your party at inopportune times. But the fact that, if you can find proper setup time to erect the hut in the first place, you can effectively create an impenetrable fortress that you can use against enemies until they either retreat or give up, or find some other way around it, is the reason why the spell takes the number 6 spot on this list. It basically allows you to do it while a force can't, which is attack things from the other side of an impenetrable barrier, while you and your party remain safely tucked away inside. What's more is that using this spell in this way is technically way outside what the initial intention of the spell is supposed to be, which is a way of allowing your party to take long rest in environments where long rest may not be possible. And at number 5 we have Hypnotic Pattern. This is a third level concentration spell which can charm, incapacitate, and reduce the movement speed of a creature to zero in a 30 foot cube within 120 feet of you if they fail with some saving throw in order to shrug off the effects. This is an amazingly powerful spell for a number of reasons. Firstly, the creature becomes charmed, which means they can't make any attacks against the one who charmed them in the first place, and grants the charmer advantage on ability checks that involve social interactions with the creature. Secondly, the creature is also incapacitated, meaning that it can't take any actions or reactions on its turn. The third reason why Hypnotic Pattern is so strong is that it also reduces a movement's creature speed to zero, so they can't get away or chase you if your party decides you're better off not engaging in that particular fight. And lastly, unlike other spells, such as Slow, which requires affected creatures to repeat their saving throw at the end of each of their turns until either the effect wears off or until they succeed, once Hypnotic Pattern succeeds, there are no further saving throws required in order to keep the effect going. In fact, the only way to break out Hypnotic Pattern is to have another creature use their action to shake you out of your stupor or be damaged in any way, whether it be accidental or intentional, or break the concentration of the caster who used the spell in the first place. This is important to note because it means that if you happen to hit every enemy in an encounter with it, then you can just end the fight right then and there. And even if you only hit a half of your enemies, or even one or two, 
you still remove those targets from the encounter and no longer have to worry about them unless one of the enemies wastes their entire action in order to make their friend snap back to reality. Which can be risky since action economy is too important to waste, especially when combats in 5e typically take no more than a few turns. And while banishment can sometimes be a better option depending on the creature in question, and the fact that there are even fewer ways to break out of being banished, Hypnotic Pattern excels at being much more generic and widely useful, due to being able to target wisdom saving throws, which are a bit more evenly spread amongst creatures overall. So in terms of non-damaging spells, it's really hard to beat Hypnotic Pattern, considering it's only a third level spell, which makes it available relatively early compared to other powerful spells in this list, making Hypnotic Pattern an absolutely fantastic spell to add to your arsenal. However, this does mean that it competes with other fantastic spells like Fireball, Slow, Lightning Bolt, and even Counterspell, which are all great spells for both damage and utility standpoints. But even then, Hypnotic Pattern's ability to instantly shrink the size of encounters and thus reducing the action economy your enemies have is definitely worth sacrificing the ability to learn any of these other third level spells, minus maybe Fireball of course, which is why Hypnotic Pattern deserves to be so high on this list. And at number 4 we have Polymorph. This is a 4th level concentration spell which can last for up to 1 hour and lets you transform one creature you can see within 60 feet into any beast so long as the beast's challenge rating is equal to or less than that target's level or CR. And if the creature is unwilling, they have to succeed in making a wisdom saving throw against it in order to avert the effects altogether. While transformed, they retain their alignment and personality but must use the stats and mental ability scores of the beast that they've been transformed into, only turning back once the spell expires or their hit points reach 0. The simplest and most straightforward use of Polymorph is turning a creature into something harmless, like a frog or a cat, where they won't be able to deal much damage or be forced to try and run away. This can be very useful for temporarily getting rid of a particular threat that might be giving your party trouble. However, the more fun way to use Polymorph is to simply transform one of your party members into a particularly powerful beast, such as a giant ape or a Tyrannosaurus Rex, both of which sport some very strong stats for the level you're allowed to transform into. Let's take the T-Rex for example. It's a huge creature with a challenge rating of 8 and a whopping total of 136 hit points, and makes two attacks in a single turn, provided the attacks are made against different targets. And both attacks the Rex have are pretty strong as well, with the bite dealing 4d12 plus 7 piercing damage and grapples and restrains your opponent instantly with a relatively high DC threshold of 17 in order to escape from it. Meanwhile, its tail deals slightly less damage overall at 3d8 plus 7, but still very respectable compared to what most classes can do at 8th level, and that's not even counting its 50 foot movement speed which can cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time, giving you free reign to chase down most enemies that might feel too intimidated to fight. And while the T-Rex only has a relatively low AC at 13, it does make up for it by having an insane amount of hit points that it can take before your party members will be forced to change back into their normal form. But that's honestly why Polymorph is considered so strong. As long as you have the spell slots that you cast in it, Polymorph basically gives your party member an entirely new health bar each time you use it. So even if your party member reverts back, you can just keep refreshing the spell over and over again until the battle is over. Of course, there is the main drawback of now labeling yourself as a big threat on the field, which might force enemies to try and knock you out of the concentration to maintain the spell. But that also assumes that they can get past the T-Rex that may or may not be blocking the way to you. And the spell only gets stronger if you're a sorcerer using the twin spell metamagic, a feature that allows you to spend sorcery points in order to cast a spell which targets a single creature onto another additional creature, allowing you to have two Rexes for the price of one 4th level spell slot. And unlike spells such as Fireball and Hypnotic Pattern, two spells that could tip the balance of encounters but don't outright change the nature of the game, Polymorph is one of those spells that can very easily topple the game's balance to the point where your DM may start considering making future encounters with Polymorph in mind specifically, which is why this spell ranks so high in this list at number 4. And at number 3 we have Conjure Woodland Beans. This is another 4th level concentration spell which works the same as a 3rd level spell, Conjure Animals, except it's specifically for summoning fake creatures. You can summon one fake creature that is of challenge rating 2 or lower, two fake creatures of CR 1 or lower, four of challenge rating 1 half or lower, or eight fake creatures of CR 1 fourth or lower. Once summoned, you roll initiative for the creatures as a group, rather than sharing your own initiative, and will follow any verbal commands you give them for the best of the abilities, but doesn't use any actions on your part to do so. Now, do you remember how chaotic being able to cast Polymorph can be? Well, imagine if you can cast Polymorph up to eight times in a single turn because that is one of the things you can do with this spell if you end up conjuring 8 pixies. Each pixie has 1 hit point and an AC of 15, so they're fairly easy to put down. But if they aren't, they each have a single casting of various spells they can cast per day, with one of them being Polymorph. They also can concentrate on an ability called Superior Invisibility, allowing them to turn invisible until they end their concentration, which can also be very useful for them in case they want to cast other spells such as Dispel Magic or even Sleep. Basically, if your party consists of 4 people, then you can essentially have four of the pixies cast Polymorph on all four of you, transforming everyone into T-Rexes, 
while the other four use superior invisibility and spread out to avoid any AoE damage as they wait for an opportunity to recast it when needed. Alternatively, each pixie also has access to the fly spell, which can create a scenario where your party can become flying T-Rexes soaring the skies. Whatever the case, this spell is extremely powerful because of polymorph and nothing else, as everything else that you can summon isn't nearly as broken or overpowered. However, it is very important to note that this might not be possible in some games, depending on how your DM runs the spells that let you summon creatures. While the intended way to run them is to let your DM choose what creatures are summoned, there are other DMs that will allow the caster to pick and choose since it can take less time since the caster will usually know what they want to summon already in the first place. But if your DM is the kind that allows you to choose what you want to summon and already knows about the pixie shenanigans, then it's often safe to assume that the option to summon pixies would be banned. So while Polymorph is the main reason why Conjure Woodland Beans can be immensely powerful, the reason why Conjure Woodland Beans takes the higher spot on this list is because it is the first spell on this list to actually have a banned option as a result of how powerful it is. And for very good reason, despite how fragile and weak the pixies themselves are. It is one of those spells that is usually worth it just for the polymorph cheese that comes with it. And at number 2, we have Simulacrum. This is a 7th level spell that basically creates an illusory duplicate of a beast or humanoid that is within touch range for the entire duration of the spell. This spell takes 12 hours to cast and requires 1500 gold pieces worth of powdered ruby, which the spell consumes. And while fairly expensive to cast, the duplicate does last until it's dispelled either by having its hit points reduced to zero, cast a dispel again, or dispelled by other means such as the use of dispel magic. The simulacrum assumes all the stats and abilities of the creature duplicating, barring its hit points, which are half of the original creatures, and is considered a construct rather than a beast or humanoid. The simulacrum is friendly to you and any creatures you designate, obeys your commands, and acts on your turn in combat. However, with the downside that it cannot grow to become more powerful, it cannot restore any expended spell slots or increase its level. And while you could make another Simulacrum at a later level to keep up with the strength of your party, the fact that it basically costs 1500 gold to do so might make it a bit tough depending on the campaign and how easy money it is to obtain. That also doesn't include any repairs you make to the Simulacrum, which costs 100 gold worth of rare herbs and minerals per hit point in order to maintain since most spells that heal don't affect constructs, which the Simulacrum is classified as. However, what the Simulacrum lacks in survivability is made up for by the fact that it's an additional body on the board that shares the same abilities as the creatures you duplicate. So, if you made a duplicate of your fighter who has also taken some levels in Barbarian, for example, then your duplicate would also be capable of using Rage, Extra Attacks, and Action Surge with no problems at all, which would result in a lot more damage being thrown out. And if your Simulacrum goes down, then the duplicate still has done its job of diverting damage away from your other party members. Alternatively, you could duplicate a Spellcaster, such as yourself, and have the duplicates cast utility spells while you focus on damaging spells or vice versa. Or you can double up on either since you both go on the same turn as each other. Being able to create a secondary version of any one member of your party is a huge power increase simply because you're effectively doubling down what party members can do. What's worse than enemies facing a party with a Gloomstalker Ranger that has a sharpshooter feat? Having to face two Gloomstalker Rangers with a sharpshooter feat, of course. And having a simulacrum that's a rage at the same time as a bear totem warrior barbarian duplicate will add a whole bunch of pressure to your enemies since they'll be forced to split their attention and have trouble dealing reliable damage since the totem warrior barbarians that have taken the bear aspect resist every damage type in the game, barring psychic. While simulacrum is indeed a powerful spell on its own, the main reason why this spell in particular takes number two spot is because it can be made even stronger than the use of another spell called wish. Basically, at 17th level, you can make a simulacrum of yourself, take a long rest to restore your spell slots, have that Simulacrum cast a wish in order to cast Simulacrum on you without any material components. The new Simulacrum will then be able to cast both Simulacrum and Wish, so you basically repeat the process until you've amassed a massive army of illusionary clones of yourself. And if you're worried about money or costs, you can have one of the duplicates cast a wish for the necessary components. While this is all technically rules as written, this isn't something that's always allowed, or often comes with very heavy restrictions. For much of the same reasons choosing 8 pixies for Conjure Woodland Beans isn't allowed. It's just too powerful and can very easily toss the game's balance out the window. In fact, the Adventures League, an official organized play system run by Wizards of the Coast, have actually nerfed this combo for balancing purposes. The short version is that Simulacrums aren't allowed to cast the spell Simulacrum or any other spell that duplicates its effects. And if Simulacrum casts a wish in order to wish for something outside of what's listed in the description for wish, then the consequences and risk of never being able to cast wish again also apply to you instead of just your Simulacrum, and extends to any future Simulacrums you create. While these rules aren't 100% official outside of AL, it does demonstrate just how strong this combination is, considering it forced a new ruling for it. However, even outside of the wish cheese, Simulacrum stands on its own as a very useful and powerful spell. As for the enabler of the Simulacrum cheese, and at number 1, we have Wish, a 9th level spell that can basically grant you any wish you want, with your DM being the one to decide how the wish turns out. 
And while you can freely duplicate a spell of 8th level or lower using Wish without any consequences, anything outside of that incurs penalties as a result due to the stress of casting such a powerful spell. Firstly, every time you cast a spell, you take 1d10 necrotic damage per level of that spell that can't be mitigated in any way. Your strength also drops to 3 for 2d4 days, which can be reduced by spending the next few days resting and not exerting yourself. But the most important thing to note is that there is a 33% chance that you just lose the ability to ever cast Wish again. However, all of these effects are very inconsequential when you consider just how far you can go with Wish. You can rewrite a piece of history, become unkillable, or destroy your enemies instantaneously. You might bring important NPCs back to life or restore lost civilizations, or simply become the richest person in existence. Maybe you choose to become the ruler of the Abyssal Plains or control an entire army of undead even. There are just so many possibilities with Wish that only having a 33% chance to never cast Wish again and needing a couple of days of rest afterwards seems way too nice of a penalty. However, in the end, your DM does have the final say in regards to how your Wish plays out. But a lot of the time, DMs might incorporate a monkey's paw effect to a Wish that is made outside of the listed examples in the spell's description that might give you a pause for the next Wish you might make. Wish is just one of those spells where you really need to work together in order to make something work in a way that is satisfying and pleasing to everyone involved. Since changing certain events in history may impact other players in your party or outright force your DM to make changes to the campaign accordingly. While this can be fun and interesting, it can also be stressful if not handled well. Sometimes it might not even be worth dealing with in the first place, so some DMs might outright ban Wish from campaigns to begin with. As for why this spell takes its house on this list, well it's because Wish really is as powerful as it seems. There are no special gimmicks about this spell, and even the safe spells that can't get monkey pod are still plenty useful. Being able to create a non-magical object that's worth 25,000 gold pieces is not terrible. Especially if you can find a way to sell whatever it is you create. Fully healing your entire party and cleansing their debuffs is also really good. Especially as a last resort sort of deal in tough situations. Granting resistance to a damage type forever for up to 10 creatures is frighteningly strong. Especially if you can find a way to gain easy resistance to every damage type in the game. Which isn't hard if you're allowed to cheese with simulacrums. You can also grant immunity to a specific spell or magical effect for 8 hours, or you can just undo basically anything that's happened within the last round of combat, which in itself can mean forcing a reroll, undoing a saving throw by an enemy, etc, etc. There are just so many things you can do with this spell that it's no wonder why it's usually considered the strongest and most broken spell in the game. Alright, and there's the list. Are there any other spells not on this list that you would particularly consider to be extremely powerful? Or do you have any ideas for future top 10 videos just like this one? If so, I'd love to put those things down in the comments below. And take care.